Hello, so today I'll be lecturing about Kant on perception. And since this is quite a broad topic that Kant covered in his magnum opus, Critique of Pure Reason, this lecture will only be a summary of the key ideas. And in the bottom right corner of this slide, you can see a statue of Kant in his hometown of Konigsberg, which has since been renamed Kaliningrad. Okay, overview. We'll begin by discussing how Kant settled the empiricism vs. rationalism debate, which was prominent in the Enlightenment era and is quite important to the foundations for lots of modern theories. Then we'll consider the conditions for perception in the external world and in the mind. And I don't think Kant would really personally like my distinction here between the external world and the mind but I think it's necessary to get a better understanding of Kant's ideas. Then we'll consider how a manifold proceeds to the understanding. And it's clear to note here that the word manifold was a Kantian term that should not be confused with the mathematical usage of the word or the general usage. And then finally, I'll talk about how the limits of the understanding can restrain some aspects of the human experience and what exactly happens when those limits are pushed and what it means, especially for modern society, the individual, maybe even the physical world. Okay, how did Kant settle the empiricism vs rationalism debate? So this may be familiar to you, but empiricism is the view that all knowledge arises from sensory experience and Kant called this sensation and he also used this Latin phrase called a posteriori which basically means after experience or post experience or known after experience and then opposing empiricism is the view rationalism which is the idea that all knowledge arises from rational thought Kant calls this intuition and it's synonymous with a priori, which means prior to experience or before experience or known before experience. And you may be wondering why empiricism and rationalism are both quite important. Well, it's clear to note that some of the greatest philosophers in history were a member of one of these groups. For example, David Hume was an empiricist, John Locke was an empiricist, George Berkeley was an empiricist, and then on rationalism you have Leibniz and Descartes and Wolf. And empiricism is important because some people like logical positivists, like Alfred Jules Eyre, consider empiricism to be the scientific method. And rationalism is important because it is sort of the foundations for mathematics and also geometry and anything to do with a priori knowledge in general. And then Kant's view about this was something called transcendental idealism, which is the view that all knowledge begins empirically, but that is then understood rationally which reduces the binary opposition between empiricism and rationalism because Kant thought that it was quite limiting. And so instead he thought that both aspects of empiricism and rationalism could be synthesized together into this thing called the transcendental idealism. And it's also clear to note here that transcendental idealism is often used as an, an encompassing term for all of Kantian philosophy and not just this particular view, but it's best to understand transcendental idealism as knowledge beginning empirically and being understood rationally. And you may ask why Kant advocated for a synthesis between empiricism and rationalism. Well, a simple answer to that is because he was inspired by both empiricists and rationalists. Namely, one of his greatest philosophical inspirations was David Hume, an empiricist. And 
after he graduated from his university, he went on to study with various rationalist philosophers and also read lots of rationalist books, namely from the likes of Leibniz and Wolfs. And here's a quote from Kant. Although all our knowledge begins with experience, it does not follow that it arises from experience. So the key terms are begins and arises. And I think what Kant is implicating here is that empiricists commit the logical fallacy of genetic fallacy by judging something based on its origins. And so Kant argues that the beginning of something is not necessarily the essence of the thing. And yes, so now the next slide. What are the conditions for perception in the external world? One of the key defining features of Kantian philosophy is the distinction between noumena and phenomena. Phenomena can be interpreted as the empirical objects that we perceive, and noumena as the unknowable objects that are only possibly known through reason or not knowable at all. And there are two main types of noumena. You have your negative noumena and also positive noumena, which I'll touch on in a second. So when most people say the word noumena, they're referring to negative noumena, which is synonymous and can be used interchangeably with the word things in themselves. And negative noumena are basically objects prior to perception, or at least empirical knowledge, and are the passive essences from which perceived phenomena is based upon. And a popular example of this can be the idea of a sausage factory or something. Uh, so you have a sausage, but you don't know where the sausage comes from. It can be from a sausage factory or maybe from a hot dog vendor or somewhere else. And the origin of that sausage can be considered the negative noumena. But then the sausage as you perceive it is the phenomena. And the second type is positive noumena. And Kant thought that positive noumena was not certain to exist and are supposedly only known through the intellectual intuition and they denote the active essences rather than the passive essences of the negative no? and they concern the changes in objects rather than the objects themselves and so from this you could link it to phenomenology at least Husserlian phenomenology and argue that Husserlian phenomenology concerns itself mainly with the negative noumena which is the things themselves or the things in themselves. But Kantianism concerns itself more with positive noumena. And positive noumena is also synonymous with the idea of pure reason in Kant. And pure reason is basically the governing order of empirical perception and can also be used interchangeably with divine reason. And this links well with the idea of positive noumena and the intellectual intuition. And Kant thought that only a divine intellect, like a supreme being, omnipotent God, could have this intellectual intuition to understand the changes in beings. But there was this scholar of Kant called Reinhold, who thought that intellectual intuition is present in all of us because it is in the definition of pure reason to be contained within us. So Reinhold emphasizes the divine in us rather than the divine above or rather the Christian God, which Kant made a famous argument for in his book, the only argument for the existence of a God. And the final condition in the external world are the manifolds. Manifolds are basically the disorganized array of appearances 
that are presented to the mind and then organized by the mind. By appearances, I refer to phenomena before it is subjectively perceived. And so it becomes an objective representation. And manifolds are basically how empirical objects are presented to the mind before the mind recognizes or categorizes or understands or identifies any of it based on a priori knowledge. And yes, yeah, so these are manifolds and we'll go into a bit more depth about how they're organized later. What are the conditions for perception in the mind? So in the mind, you have space and time as pure intuitions that govern the observations of the material world. This was explored in a section of Kant's book, The Critique of Pure Reason, called The Transcendental Aesthetic, which dealt with the elements of Kantian philosophy. And he discussed space and time as fundamental to the human experience. And he called these pure intuitions because he said space and time cannot be empirically known and they must be known a priori and thus they are pure intuitions because they're not polluted by experience in any way. And it may be argued, well, why space and time? Why not things like sound or maybe color or something else? Well, this was made famous in Kant's six or so arguments for this. And I think one of his most famous arguments for this is that you cannot conceive of a world where space and time do not exist. Like, for example, how can you have an object that is nowhere without space? Or how can you have it when it's like, at no time specifically without time. And so Kant thought that you cannot conceive of anything without space and time. However, an exception to this would be a god, like uh, the traditional omnipotent conception of a god, because I think this links well with Plato's theory of forms and how he thought that the perfect unchanging concepts or maybe the God are transcendent beyond atemporal, beyond temporal and spatial limitations and thus they are atemporal, aspatial. And here's a quote from Kant. It is only from a human standpoint that we know of such things as space and, space and time. And I think this was from about page 72 of the Critique of Pure Reason where he argues that maybe space and time are purely concepts that the human species have created for convenience, of course. And another condition is sensible intuition, which is opposed to intellectual intuition. And it allows for empirical apperception, which is the subjective experience of the world or rather the subjective inter interpretation of the appearances. And Kant thought that what distinguished human beings from say animals was this ability for sensible intuition. And maybe also what he called the intelligibility, which is the ability for human minds to both have aspects of the intellectual intuition without knowing it possibly exists and also having aspects of the sensible intuition. Okay, how can a manifold proceed to the understanding? So as we have covered earlier, a manifold is basically the disorganized array of empirical objects as they're presented to the mind. But how exactly do we understand objects in the world? How do we categorize them? How do we differentiate from, say, a cat from another cat? And this was one of the key topics that Kant discussed in his Critique of Pure Reason, which is how we know what we know and how we can know at all. 
and a manifold proceeds to the understanding through the mind understanding organizing and categorizing particular objects from a manifold via the table of 12 categories which you can see there now the table of 12 categories was from the critique of pure reason and how Kant came up with all of these categories is quite complex. There was some really complicated logic going on in a section called the Transcendental Deduction of Categories, which I won't go into too much detail right now, but all you need to know is that there are these 12 categories by which we understand the world and categorize objects. And these 12 categories can be separated into four. There's quantity, quality, relation, and modality. Quantity is quite self-evident. It's how much of something there is. Quality is quite simple as well. It's whether it has any properties specifically, and it's to do with the predicates of the concept, and more so like the predicates that concern the entire concept and yeah we also have relation which is how the object relates to other objects and modality which concerns the logical conditions of the object and i think one of the key categories you should pay attention to is the category of of community which is the reciprocity between the active and the passive. And the, I think you should pay attention to this in particular because it ties in well with Kantian ethics. Because in Kantian ethics, the first formulation of the categorical imperative suggests that basically you should will everything to be a universal law and do things as if everyone would do it as well. And this is really similar to the Bible verse Matthew seven twelve, which suggests you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And basically it suggests that uh, there's a certain reciprocity or reciprocal relation between the active and passive. And an example of this is if you have a bully the bully is actively beating up a victim and the victim is in this case the passive and so using the category of of community you could say that because there's this reciprocity the bully is beating up the victim as much as the victim is bullying the bully and as much as the bully is bullying themselves and as much as the victim is victimizing themselves. And this is quite an interesting concept. And Kant calls this entire process of the 12 categories being unconsciously used to organize and distinguish objects from the manifold, the synthetic unity of the manifold. And so it's quite self-evident. It's you synthetically unify objects from the manifold and you distinguish their predicates and properties and this idea of synthetic ties well into kantian logic although it's not formally called kantian logic because kant thought that the aristotelian system of logic was already complete but anyways kant thought that aside from hume's fork where you have your analytic judgments where things are self-evident, for example, all dogs are animals. And you also have your synthetic judgments, which are things known through experience, or supposedly only known through experience, or things that are not self-evident. For example, all dogs in Hong Kong are white. And that is obviously not true. So it is most likely a synthetic proposition. And Kant thought that there was a third one called the synthetic a priori. And if you may remember, the a priori links to rationalism. And basically, synthetic a priori judgments are 
judgments where it can it is not analytic exists in the rational plane alone and thus can only be synthetic for example you can take geometry there is the common statement the shortest path from a to b is a straight line well you cannot know this through analytic truths because this is not self-evident you can't know this through synthetic because it's not directly empirically known and thus you can only know it through synthetic a priori judgments and you know it synthetically in a way but also a priori and Kant thought that this was the final stage of empirical apperception and there was this quote I forgot to include where Kant basically said that knowledge begins with experience and ends with the understanding or the reason or human reason or pure reason. And final slide, what are the limits of the understanding and what happens when those limits are pushed? So as you may have wondered, Kant's view suggests that human reason is not complete and there are certain constraints and limits to it, to what humans can know and how we know it. And so the one of the key limits is that we can never understand objective truth because the synthetic unity of the manifold makes the objective appearances of the world subjective and these objective appearances are themselves only representations of noumena. And by objective truth, I refer to noumena, basically the underlying structures for reality and the essences that constitute being in the world. And by the word representation, you may be wondering, well, what exactly does that mean? Well, in the book in the, of the world as will and representation by Arthur Schopenhauer, a contemporary of Kant, he argues that representation is basically synonymous with the appearances in the world that are perceived rather than the will, which is interchangeable with the noumena. And representation also is defined by Reinhold as a hylomorphic compound, which derived from the Aristotelian idea that representations are the unity of matter and form. And I think representation is a key idea in philosophy because theories like Kantianism all tie in back to the representational theories of consciousness, which was a common tra Western philosophical tradition where there is a dichotomy between truth and illusion or reality and fantasy. And also, you could argue that the understanding is confined through the manifold and categories, and maybe also the noumena themselves, and also the appearances that are subject to the manifolds and the categories. And then when those limits are pushed, the result is an antinomy of pure reason. Antinomies of pure reason were explored by Kant in also the critique of pure reason, which began at around page 390, where he talked about, well, the antinomies of pure reason. And he thought that antinomies of pure reason were basically these unresolvable paradoxes that are supposedly not paradoxes. And you can see my explanation here, where there's a thesis and an antithesis, which both conform to logic and are logical and coherent, but the conclusions end up in an unresolvable contradiction. And by contradiction, I refer to a concept or a proposition and the negated form of that. So there's like P and negated P, and this is what it implies by contradiction.
and this idea of an antinomy links well with the Western philosophical tradition of dialectic, where there are two opposing sides, which Hegel thought could be synthesized together, although he never explicitly stated that. And Kant thought that antinomies of pure reason reflect limits of human understanding, especially in metaphysical matters. Well, why is this the case? Well, Kant thought that you have to go back to the very definition of an antinomy of pure reason. There's a thesis and an antithesis that are both perfectly logical. But then, by the term logical, you're referring to human logic. And human logic, Kant thought, could never understand pure reason or some divine logic out there. And so that's why he thought it was especially challenging in metaphysical matters, where human reason could not understand divine reason. And then by logic, it reflects that the human system of logic is never complete and thus reflect the, the limits of human understanding. And this links pretty well to Gödel's incompleteness theorem, where there can never be a complete system of mathematics. And the logician Wilhelm Quine identified antinomies as the most critical type of paradox as opposed to his other two types of paradoxes, which he thought were not actually paradoxes and just tricks on the mind, and were only known to be paradoxes intuitively and not as factually considered paradoxes. And yes, so this is what it means by the limits being pushed when you have antinomies, and yes, so this is the end of my lecture. I hope you enjoyed it.